So welcome to today's session, teaching the whole child, dealing with these younger learners, six, seven, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, looking at the whole learner. Uh, the opening quote for today's session, <coughs> seeing children in different ways. And it says here, to the doctor, the child is a typhoid patient. To the playground supervisor, a first baseman. To the teacher, a learner of arithmetic, or in our case, a learner of English. At times, the child may be different things to each of these specialists, but too rarely are they seen as a whole child to any of them. And I thought this was interesting more than anything because of the date, the 1930 White House report. And I don't know if in 2014 we've changed that much. I think we do tend to look at children quite often in very isolated ways or when they come into our English class we don't really consider the rest of the things that have happened in that child's life outside the classroom. Okay, for the warm-up, we're talking about the whole child. I'd like you to think now of some challenges in life, some of life's challenges. It might be a personal challenge for you or it might just be a situation. For example, a challenge might be having to move house, having to change cities and move to a new city or a new house is a challenge. And in order to be successful with that challenge, what sort of skills might we need? So for example, if I'm going to move house, I first have to be probably very organized, pack my bags. I probably have to be quite calm and patient to not go crazy with all of these boxes and people coming in and out of my house. So things like that. Could we think of any challenges just before we begin? Did any, is anybody brave enough to tell us a possible life challenge? Any ideas? If not, I'll give you some clues, yeah? Oh, to be a mother or a father, to raise children. And to be, six, yeah? Oh my goodness. You have to be creative, yes very hard working and extremely patient to raise a child, definitely, for sure, and many other qualities that, that we need to be a parent. Good, any <laughs> other situations? Raising a child, moving house, possibly one of the situations, challenges in life might be something to do with health. You know, uh, I have a friend in Seville right now who very recently broke his hip skiing. Very active, sporty man, six months off with a broken leg big challenge for him. He's going to have to be patient and perseverant and learn to walk again and all of these things. We might have just problems with communication. Or one of our challenges might be exams, something academic. So when we look at these possible challenges in life, how many of these situations or of the situations you thought of can be solved purely based on academic skills? So have a quick think. How many of these, you know, with academic skills, that's all you need? Exams. Maybe the exams, but even with exams, <coughs> is it enough to sit an exam just having a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of knowledge in your head? What do you always have to, what do you also have to have to sit a good exam? Is it just knowledge? Is it just academic knowledge? No, what else do you have to be? Again, organized, hardworking, studious. The day of the exam, you have to be calm. You have to, so it's not maybe just enough to know the academics. You probably also have to have some other skills involved. So this is the point that we're trying to make about teaching the whole learner. And what I think happens sometimes in class, because we have so many children, so little time, such a big syllabus that we get obsessed Grammar rules, spelling rules, double P, S third person singular, he didn't spell the word dog correctly, ah! And we get so obsessed with academics that we forget about all of the other things. And that really, having a child who can stand and say, B was for being, go went gone, see saw seen, go, it's not going to help him at all if he doesn't know how to communicate. If when he sits an exam, he gets so nervous he can't remember the words. So I just trying to show that although we do need to focus on academic skills in class, if we don't balance it with other skills, we might have a child who then is very, very limited. 
And I think also it's very important to think that this age group, six, seven, eight, we are just laying the groundwork for their academics. And I think it's very tough for some of you who have come from secondary school or from upper primary to lower primary. Because suddenly it's like, oh, I don't just base everything on exams. I can't just threaten with more homework. You know, suddenly it's a whole new dynamic. So we're going to try to look at that <coughs> a bit today. So as it says here, on many occasions, academic knowledge is not enough to get by in today's world. As teachers, we need to prepare children to meet life's challenges, overcome life's obstacles, and to become successful citizens in today's society. <laughs> and especially with young learners, I really do believe this. I believe that our biggest task teaching these six, seven, eight-year-olds is that they finish with eight years old, they finish when they're eight, saying, I love English. I want to continue learning English. What am I going to do next year in English? That's our job, is to get them happy and ready for their academic future in a second language. So just things to think about. So let's see, do any of these situations sound familiar to you? Maybe you don't work with the very little ones, but if you do work with the very little ones, I'm sure these sound familiar to you. But let's think about these. They won't sit still, they get distracted, they all want to turn. So what I'm going to do is find out if these things happen in your class by listening to you snap. So I'm going to say this sentence, for example, they don't sit still or they won't sit still. If that's true for you in some of your classes, you snap. Okay, so, oh, they won't sit still. They get distracted. They all want to turn when we're playing the games. They forget everything we studied last month. Or yesterday, exactly. <laughs> They're very talkative. Okay, very good. So, I can see that many of us share the same situations in the classroom. Why? Why does this happen? Why? Why does this happen? Because we're bad teachers, because they're bad kids, because there are too many of them. Why does this happen? Any ideas? Why? Because they're kids. <laughs> Because they're children. This happens with children. It even happens with adults and it happens with older teens. But these qualities, talkative, distracted, don't remember, la la, it's six, seven, eight year olds. That's what they are, they're kids. And I travel around the world working with teachers, visiting classrooms, talking to children, and I can't tell you how often I visit schools where they're teaching five, six, seven-year-olds, where the teacher warns me in the coffee break, oh, we're going into the worst place on earth. They're all crazy. The children are demons. I can't control them at all. And I walk into the classroom. It's just 36-year-olds. 36-year-olds always move. It's like watching a popcorn machine. There's never any peace and quiet in class. They're not ever still for long periods of time. And I think again, quite often as teachers coming from older learners, we have very high expectations of these little people. So again, just keep in mind, children are like this. Quite often things like they forget, it's not that they forget it, they just need more repetition. It takes them longer to internalize things. They're getting a lot of information. Any of you who have children yourselves or have cousins or, or nephews and nieces, when they're five, six, seven, they're still at the stage of watching, for example, The Little Mermaid 17 times in one weekend. You know, it's not that they forgot the story from the day before, but they need that repetition. They like that repetition. That repetition helps them remember language. So just things to keep in mind, that not to panic when you're working with the little ones. So now, what does it mean to teach the whole learner? Does it mean that we're making tailor-made lessons for each of the students? That we're reviewing in a regular, on a regular basis structures and vocabulary? Or does it mean teaching beyond the academic curriculum, taking into account social and personal development? Which one's the correct answer? I want you to snap for the correct answer. Teaching the whole learner is making sure that vocabulary structures are reviewed regularly. 
Teaching the whole learner means making tailor-made lessons. Teaching the whole learner means teaching beyond the academic curriculum into the social and personal curriculum. Okay, good. So yes, good for you. The correct answer is C. Teaching beyond the academic curriculum, taking into account social and personal development. So when we talk about teaching the whole learner, we might look at things like values, social skills in class. We might look here at academic skills. And again, keep in mind that when we talk about teaching the whole learner, I am not saying throw away the curriculum, throw away the tests, throw away the vocabulary practice. I'm just saying we need balance in the classroom. So it means that we need academics and social skills, uh, keeping in mind multiple intelligence, learning styles, different interests of children, making sure that our system of grading is fair, that assessment isn't only based on one skill or on two skills, and then of course this idea of bringing in the outside world into the classroom. So these are some of the sort of bases of teaching the whole learner. Think about some values that you can work on with young learners. So for example, one value might be to share with your classmates. Think on your own of values that we can work on with young learners in the classroom, <coughs> such as sharing. We had over here, for example, somebody said that we might need to <clears throat> teach them about being patient. Another lady said that we might need to teach them how to help one another or how to help at home. Any other values that we can work on with children? I mean, values and these sorts of things, we could go on and on and on. Cooperating, playing fairly, following the rules, taking turns, helping at home, crossing the street correctly, having healthy habits, healthy eating. You know, it, it can extend <coughs> into many different areas, this idea of values training. So some of the things we might look at, are things like this, you know, values, as you said over here, as the gentleman said, helping others. So, you know, good explorers help one another. Or here, for example, in this case, they're talking about manners. And it says, a good explorer always remembers the magic words, please and thank you. So again, throughout the series, the little explorers' characters are sort of role models for the children, helping them understand how to behave better in and out of class. For example, in Poland, in Polish, are please and thank you important? Is it something that people use regularly? Okay, that's good. It actually makes it easier for you than for them to use this, because in Spain they don't. It's cultural, it's not that they're rude, but in Spain you don't tend to, for example, if you want someone to give you a glass of water, you just say, give me the glass of water. You don't have to say please. And when they give you the water, you don't have to say thank you. It's not, it's not, it's not something obligatory. And so with the little ones, you have to be all the time, please, thank you, please, thank you, please, thank you, because it is something culturally important that they don't do in their own language. So you've got a benefit that at least in Polish they do do it. Here are other things, you know, a good helper, a good explorer helps mummy and daddy at home, a good explorer listens to the teacher, things like this. And what we've also tried to do is that even in things like the little comics and the stories, we've done our best that kids are nice to each other. Because I don't know if you've had these experiences sometimes with textbooks, where the unit story sometimes isn't very nice. Like somebody's tripped somebody, or you know, it's comical, it's funny, but it's not really something you can then discuss in class. Because what's really the moral of the story? That if somebody trips and falls, we all stand around and laugh at them. Or if the cat falls off the fridge and goes splat, we all giggle. You know, I sometimes find it hard then to work on those stories in lessons. And so what we've tried to do is, even if there are some sort of funny situations where someone falls, or someone gets hit, or someone has an accident, that at least the other children are caring and say sorry, or help the child <coughs> up, or you know, they might have a giggle, but the, at the end of the story, everyone's trying to be nice to one another. Because I think, again, through stories, through activities, we do need to model good behavior <coughs> to them. Other things here, you know, taking care of our environment, you know, a good explorer respects insects, a good explorer listens carefully when they're going to cross the street, a good explorer helps people. And what I do sometimes is, you know, I go out and about in Seville with my explorers. I've actually made photocopied little ones that I can carry in my pocket. So I've got my female explorer, my male explorer, they come out walking around town with me, and for example, in this case, 
we had uh, walked through a park, and look what I found. So put the explorer in the <coughs> rubbish, took a photo of the rubbish with the explorer, went to school on Monday, showed them the picture, and said, wow, look what we found in the park. So again, using the explorers to sort of bring the outside world into the classroom and then chat with the kids. What could we do about this? What happens when we see that in the park? Who did that? Do you ever do that? Things like this. You can also use in the book what we've done every other unit, every two units. There's an actual story, you know, not with the characters from the book. It's an actual real, you know, it's a fable or a traditional story or whatever it is. In this case, it was the story of the ant <coughs> and the grasshopper. How many people, yes, I know this story. How many people, I know the story of the ant and the grasshopper? Yeah, not many. I was surprised yesterday as well. I thought that this was like a universal story, but it's not as universal as I thought. So the story here is of a little ant who works very hard every day, saving his seeds for the winter, making his house for the winter, doing everything for the winter, while the grasshopper just sort of lies around scratching his tummy, going to the beach and doing different activities. Well, imagine what happens when winter comes. The little ant has a food and a home, and the grasshopper has nothing. So, you know, in the end, the grasshopper and the ant become friends, the ant helps the grasshopper sort of <coughs> under the condition that the grasshopper will lend a hand next year. So again, looking at sharing, looking at working hard, at saving, at, you know, being organized with your time through a story with insects. The other thing we do is work on things like the family, you know, the mummy and daddy are going to dinner and the kids are staying with grandpa and there's a battle about bedtimes, so, you know, common situations for them. And then, of course, with the kids, you can talk about how to resolve these situations. And what do we do when grandpa says to go to bed and we don't want to go to bed? What should we do? And you can all be done in English, but sort of, again, bringing the family, the city, everything into the classroom for them. In this case, we're going to listen to a little song called My Super Sister. I want you to think, what would you do with this song in your lesson? How would you do it in your lesson? And I want you to think, what's the message? What are we trying to tell the kids through the song? My Super Sister. Swim and dive And that's not all She can ride a horse And skateboard too She's very sporty How about you? She's my super, super sister Wow! Okay, I'm going to stop it there Because you don't need to listen to the whole song But here we had the song Super Sister. First of all, if we were doing this in class, what might we do as teachers? So we've got my sister can skate and she can run, she can dive and swing. What would we maybe do in class to keep the children paying attention? What could we do? Mime. Miming, exactly, acting it out. So if I were doing this in class, we would have my sister can skate, she can run. So we would be doing the actions. Why would I want the little ones to be doing the actions with me? Yeah, to wake them up. Well, actually, normally they're quite awake, yes. <laughs> but to keep them focused, very good, to keep them focused on one thing. It helps them to memorize the words, it helps them to recall the words. And again, if we've already said, they're so active, they're so talkative, they never sit still, we'll give them something to do. Give them a way to let that energy come out in a channeled, organized, structured way. Because if we have them sitting for 60 minutes, they will move anyway. Whether you guide them or not, they're going to move. So better to give them some guided movement and sort of not <laughs> expect miracles from them. The same thing here, we're again trying to give this positive message. It's a little brother singing about all the lovely things that his older sister can do. So again, as homework, you might say, well, come in and tell us about a super member of your family. Who's super in your family? <coughs> wow, are you serious? Your dad can drive and he can cook, 
and he does the fix-ups at home. Wow, your dad's incredible. You know, things like that. So you can also have a super dad or a super grandma or super auntie who can help kids out in different ways. We also try to make sure that kids know how to take turns. They know how to play fairly. We give tips in the teacher's book of how to deal with kids when they have tantrums about losing or tantrums about not having a turn. These are all things that we as teachers have to help guide them with. They're children. They don't understand these things. So we're setting them up for being prepared to do pair work and group work and games when they're teenagers. If we start at six, teaching them how to behave when they're playing. So here, you know, they have their little cards. The child says, ah, I'm right. It's my turn again. Or it's here, oh, I'm wrong. It's your turn. It's your card. So again, telling them and teaching them how to win, how to lose, how to take a turn, how to play fairly through different activities in the book. As you've mentioned, we mentioned before in the introduction section, there's also a lot of importance given to learning how to learn, building learner autonomy, doing self-reflection <coughs> tasks, and again, always done in a very age-appropriate way so that the kids can sort of see their progress, but through a game or through an activity. We also do things like this, you know, sort of lots of personalization tasks. Little ones, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight. They're still very much at that me, 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 I, 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 my, my, my stage. Very, very self-centered. So again, we try to give them that opportunity to talk about themselves through games and communication tasks. In this case, I'm going to say some sentences. If the sentence is true for you, that you can do the activity, you clap. If you cannot do the activity, you stop. Ready? So here, the child says, I can play the guitar. Stop. One, two, three. Okay, yes. So we've got a couple of guitar players, not many. I can sing. Good, I can speak English? Okay, very good. Do you have the idea? What I would do here in class, oh, somebody was stamping. <laughs> the French conference is across the hall. <laughs> the uh, idea here is that the kids have an opportunity to see what they do, they don't do. And if you do it in class, what I normally do is I ask, like once we've done the four from the book, I get the children to either tell me or write on pieces of paper <coughs> sentences about themselves. So, you know, I can do karate, or I can, you know, I don't know, play the violin. And it's fascinating how they find people in class who they didn't know shared a hobby with them, who share a hobby with them. You know, suddenly you hear two kids clapping and they look over at each other like, oh, you do judo as well? Or you also play the violin? So I think it's very important, again, that we give kids opportunities to get to know each other, find out what they have in common, find out what dislikes they have in common, because the more they get along, the better they'll work together and the calmer we'll be in class. So it works out better for everyone. Another challenge that I always had in my lessons were the fast finishers. How many people also feel a bit desperate with these kids who are like, I finished, I finished, I finished, I finished. And you have the other kid like, what book? <laughs> what page? And the other one's totally finished. How many people share this experience? Okay, yeah, God, we all do. Okay, what I used to do in my classroom, what I used to have is like at the top of the blackboard, like when we did our daily routine, today's Monday, it's sunny, blah, blah, blah. I also had a little finished flag at the top and I would put on the blackboard, you know, draw a pink elephant, uh, write three sentences about your hobbies, or, you know, read a magazine. So I would give them sort of three different options. I tried to normally make one drawing, one reading, one listening or something, so there was some balance. So when the kids did this, finish, 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 ah! I, and they would ask me, in Spanish, all they say is, que hago, que hago, que hago, which is, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? And they repeat it until you go mad. <coughs> and so now I would just say to them, what do you do? Que haces? Come on. You know what to do. You know what to do when you're finished. You have options here for when you're finished. So again, helping them understand that we can't always entertain them when they're finished, that we aren't always entertained when we're standing in the queue at the bank or when we're waiting at the post office. We don't have somebody coming out to entertain us and offer us worksheets. We have to entertain ourselves. 
So again, helping them understand how to entertain themselves. What we've done in the book is at the bottom of the activity book pages, they actually have indications. So you can start off right at the beginning of the school year saying, and when we finish our work, and when teachers seen that it's well done, you can pick an activity. Look at the explorers at the bottom of the page. Pick an activity to do. So again, giving them some autonomy and giving us a little bit of a, a breather from making 500 photocopies that we have to keep bringing to class. And then half the time, the kids say that they've already done them when they haven't. You know, they get all confused because they might have seen the type of activity. You give them the worksheet and I don't want that one. I did it already. I don't like that. <laughs> Ooh, you know. So it's quite challenging. So some solutions then for fast finishes. And just coming here to the core curriculum, as it says here, schools should develop a positive attitude towards learning. A positive attitude. And we don't get a positive attitude teaching six-year-olds like 16-year-olds. It's not going to make a positive attitude for them. They're going to come out depressed. They're going to come out hating English. You're going to come out thinking that it's been a disaster. They're going to come out thinking it's been a disaster. So keep in mind, you're doing the right thing according to the curriculum if they like English. Just let them like it. Have a good attitude towards learning. Arouse curiosity about the world. Discover and search for the truth. You know, and again, this is very far away from memorizing grammar tables. You know, there's a long distance between that. So, you know, I try to find some balance in class with those things. So now we're going to think about hooking their attention. We might hook their attention through things like other subjects in English. Most children, six, seven, eight, it's very difficult to analyze whether they will be linguistic learners or not. They're too small. But they will probably show interest in things like science and insects and maths and all sorts of different things. They're not cognitively ready to understand language in itself. They might like English class, but they're not ne necessarily linguists sort of yet. So we have to figure out subjects in English they might like. Of course, use digital resources, which our children are fascinated by. Make sure there's lots of variety in class. And then, as we said before, bring in the real world as much as possible. So here we might look at some math. If we were doing it in class today, how many people are wearing red? Oh, one, two, three, four, five. Let's mark it on the graph. How many people are wearing gray? How many people are wearing black? So you could do all sorts of things just showing class results. <coughs> how many people have pets? How many people have a dog, a cat, a canary? So it's stuff that we do anyway with them putting their hands up or giving their answers. The only difference now is that we would put it on some sort of a graphic organizer where they could see the results. We might look at things like insects and animals. How many people agree that the young learners that they know like talking about animals and insects and things like this? How many people, yes, they agree? And they do, I tend to find that. So in this case, the kids are looking at camouflage and dangerous colors of dangerous animals. So in this case, you know, some insects look like other things. This is a <coughs> butterfly, but it looks like a leaf. You can't see it. And a lot of these, these lessons, actually, it was a little bit selfish. Because a lot of these were things that I remember loving when I was a kid. I remember loving looking at National Geographic magazine and trying to find the hidden camouflaged animals or trying to you know, learn how a stick insect moved. And so again, we tried to apply some of these things that, you know, that many of us as authors remembered from our childhood into the series. And we're going to look at a video on this later. As we mentioned before, another way of bringing the real world into the classroom is using the explorers, taking them out with you, letting the kids take them home for the evening, come in the next day, what did you do with the explorers? What did you guys have for dinner? Where did the explorers sleep? Or slept in your bed? Or slept on the table next to your bed? So things like that. Talk to the kids and give them an opportunity. So in my case, the explorers and I went out for a walk. It wasn't actually yesterday, because yesterday I was here in Poland and it was freezing. But we went for a walk the other day in Seville. What two things did we see? So we went out walking. We saw some things. What did we see? So you have a choice of shoes, pets, sweets, sunglasses, plants, fruits, and vegetables. Tell the person next to you, or think in your mind, what two things did we see? So just tell the person next to you, I think they saw plants and shoes. So I think they saw sunglasses and 
vegetables or whatever. Let's see. So we went out for our walk yesterday. What did we see? We saw ding, 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 good fruits and vegetables. Well done. And what do you think the children do in class when this comes up and they guessed correctly? What do they do? They just, what do they do? <laughs> Told you. Knew it. And do you have to be an English scholar to get that correct? Do you have to know a lot about grammar and spelling rules and just guessing? You have just as much of an opportunity of getting it correct as the smart kid next to you. So the little ones in the class who don't know a lot of English, who don't do very well, are suddenly got it right. All it was was guessing. So giving them again an opportunity to feel good about learning. So we saw some fruits and vegetables and we saw shoes. shoes. You got it. Okay, very good. So you have the idea. This one was actually quite funny. In this case, if you, if you do get the book and you do get the explorer, break your shyness and take them out with you. Because in this case, I was actually really shocked. We went to a, I went to a market with quite rough men working at the market, you know, big guys with cigars and things. And I took the explorer and I was sort of putting her in different places on the stands. And suddenly, this very big man came up and was sort of, uh, he said, what are you doing? And I was like, oh God. And I was like, it's a school project. I'm showing the kids about different things. And he took the explorer. And I was like, oh God, you know, goodbye explorer. Never going to see him again. And he took it and he sort of walked over to the other side of the stand like this. And he put the explorer down and he looked up and he said, these strawberries look nicer. And I was like, oh my God. It's like, okay, okay. So again, and the explorers have gotten me into cockpits on airplanes, into where the train drivers drive the trains, because all you have to do is go up to the pilot with your explorer and say you're doing a school project and they let you in almost anywhere. So a good ticket into many different places when you get out there. And again, let the kids do the same. They don't have a camera, if they don't have access to internet or things like that, just get them to draw what they did with the explorer when they went out. In the book, we've also tried to include some culture and culture that's age appropriate and culture appropriate. And as in Poland, many kids have the opportunity to go to the countryside or maybe granny and grandpa have a house in the countryside. We've put some sort of animals and situations that are familiar to kids and that hopefully could be familiar to the kids, not so abstract. The other thing we've included in the course uh, is games. So one of the things you'll find in your pack is this coordinates poster. So what do you think I might use that for? So I've got a lovely poster here with, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, across the top, and the letters down the side. So why or how could I use a poster like this in class to review, exactly, to review the key vocabulary. And we decided to do it like this with the coordinates to give teachers an opportunity to do some sort of extra things. Like quite often when it's on the big poster, it's hard for us to localize things on the poster and hard for them to find them as well. So in this case, I might say to the kids things like, what can you see in D5? What can you see in D5? We see a, a coat, a raincoat, and some boots, like that. Or you could do things like true or false. So I might say to the class, B6, a butterfly. Yes or no? B6, a butterfly. Yes no. or no? Let's see, show me your fingers. Yes or no? B6, a butterfly. Exactly. You can do true or false. Yes or no. Find the image. Or I might say something like, I spy with my little eye a guitar. What coordinate? Can anybody see the guitar? A1 or 1A, exactly. Okay? So again, it makes it a lot easier when the kids aren't saying, eh, there, eh, you know, they are coming up to the board. All they have to do is give you the coordinate and you can find it. They can also do things like writing the coordinate on each other's hands writing the coordinates on each other's backs, writing messages. And this coordinates poster is also very special because it helps the kids solve their mystery quest. So when we have here in our book, throughout the book, 
You'll see little explorers in the corners with coordinates. Well, those coordinates are used with the poster to help the kids solve their final quest message. So throughout the year, the kids are working unit by unit on secret messages through the coordinates posted. So they can actually see where they're going, how many units we've done, how many units we have, and every single clue, they're getting closer to figuring out the final message, what will be their certificate to take home. So again, we've tried as much as possible to have all sorts of little <coughs> tricky things for the children to be entertained by as they're doing their schoolwork. That it sort of goes beyond just doing the curriculum and letting them enjoy learning English a little bit. So Oxford Explorers motivates learners, taking into account different learners with different abilities, different tastes, lots of resources, and lots of variety. So we'll finish off there, <coughs> just letting you know about the digital classroom. You'll have lots of clips, karaoke, flashcard games, stories on your iTools. This is just an example of the iTools, class book with activity book and tools. How many people have access to or a whiteboard or a projector at their school or in their classrooms? Okay, not so bad. Could be better, but not so bad. So, again, you can use it with your whiteboard or you can just use it with a computer. <coughs> but you have all of your work there. And then, of course, you have, you know, your main pages of the book with your tools and then all of your songs, posters, and activities at your fingertips. There's also audio visual material though, with a DVD and with DVD lessons to follow. So I'm just going to show you a couple of seconds of one of the clips, just so you get an idea. <coughs> they really, honestly, the DVDs are excellent. They go to aquariums and castles and parks and all sorts of different things. So let's find out what we're going to explore today. Holly and I are explorers. Today, we're at Tropical World. I've got binoculars and a camera. Holly's got a notebook. Can I have the camera, please? Yes, here you are. Smile. Great, let's go and see the insects. Here's a leaf insect. It's green. Okay, so you get the idea. But nice, slow pace, interesting topics, things that the kids can relate to, and that maybe then they can go home and do some investigation about. And like I said, step-by-step -step guidance with worksheets to do the DVDs in your lessons. Uh, and just to finish, let's see if you can figure out. Okay, let's try it together. There is no end to education. It's not that you read a book, pass an and finish with an education. The whole of life, from the moment you are to the moment you die, is a process of learning. And I do honestly, firmly believe this. The longer I teach, the more I believe that our job as educators is really to get them ready for what's going to be out there in the real world and, uh, and to keep that learning process going. Just to finish off, just so you know, some resources for you and for your teachers and your students. We've got here Keeping Parents Involved, a website for parents with information on how to help kids at home. <coughs> for you, my friends, I would love for any of you to participate in the Oxford Magazine. I'm the editor, so don't be afraid to send us a letter. We have over 6,000 readers each month, so it's a very nice way for you to get your ideas published in a safe forum. So anyway, this is the <coughs> web page, Oxford Magazine. We've had articles from Anya. Do you know Anya Musilak? Has she done talks here, Anya? 
or Veronica, Salita, Veronica. I'm sure you know them because they, they've done trainings here before. But anyway, so feel free to let me know if you'd like to participate. And if you wouldn't like to participate, don't worry, you've got lots of classroom ideas, ideas for parents and things on the website as well. We're also on Facebook. Has anybody got uh, a link to Facebook, to the ELT site? Good, okay. So you can find out there about the ELT blog, webinars, free seminars and things like that. So, well done. Thank you very much for joining us. Good job, everyone.